As they were singing that, I, I could not help but just think about how, what good it is, what a joy to know it is that God can give you a brand new start. Nobody has to let their past define them. Amen? Praise God. We are so glad you're here tonight. Would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3 tonight. We're going to get right into the Word of God. So enjoy the presence of the Lord tonight. But we love His Word, don't we, church? Philippians chapter 3. When you get there, put a marker, your Bible ribbon, an offering envelope, and then turn to Acts chapter 19. Two passages tonight. I'll give you the title in a moment. But Philippians chapter 3 and then Acts chapter 19. I told you this morning that I'm, I'm not one to use sports a lot from the pulpit. I've seen how sports has pulled so many people away from church, so I always want to be careful. But this illustration is going to lead into what I want to preach about for a few moments tonight. How many have ever heard of Michael Jordan? Arguably the best basketball player that ever lived. Played for Chicago, by the way, I'm just saying. In his 15 years in the NBA, Michael Jordan averaged 32 points a game. Think about that. Averaged 32 points a game for his entire career of 15 years. A reporter asked him how he could maintain such a high average over those years. And he replied, here's what I do. I simplify the matter. It, to it takes only eight points per quarter to score 32. I find a way every quarter simply to get those eight points. You see, Michael Jordan, every game had a goal. And that goal was to score so many points per quarter. Someone said, thank goodness, he also had an education too. Because 32 divided by 4 equals 8. They said that the University of North Carolina, that's known as long division. You see, successful people, successful teams, successful businesses, and even successful churches all have one thing in common. They start with a goal. They start with a goal. I want to talk to you tonight about the power of a goal in your life. Every football player in the NFL has one goal. And that's to win the Super Bowl. Every major league baseball player goes in with one goal in mind. What is it? To win the World Series. Every hockey player has one goal. I got a ring going on, Brian. Every hockey player has one goal, and that's to win Stanley Cup. And every major league soccer player has one goal. That's to win the World Cup. The bottom line is you have to have a goal. I want you to read with me in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 8. Because I think if there was ever a person who would be a good example of setting a goal, it would be the Apostle Paul. Can I hear an amen? Paul says, yet indeed, I also count all these things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed unto his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or already perfected, but I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. These verses we always read around the first of the year when we talk about making resolutions, but I think every now and then it's good to go back to these verses and talk about how important it is to set goals in our lives. Did you know there are many people in life today that are simply wandering with no direction? One of the defining marks of our younger generation, and I say this with all respect to our younger folks, but one of the defining marks of our younger generation is they have no direction. They're just wandering aimlessly with no direction. But there are many adults who simply live day to day, paycheck to paycheck, with no purpose, no fulfillment, no joy in their life. They're just existing day to day, just surviving. 
And the reason is, is because they don't have any goals. They have nothing to shoot for. And Paul said, but we have been called to live for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Church, we have something to live for. We have something to live for. Now, let me just take for a minute and talk a little bit about just goals in general. And then we're going to break it down. We're going to get to Acts 19 in a moment. First of all, goals can be God-given or they can be man-driven. Let me explain the difference. First of all, goals can be God-given. Those are what we call spiritual goals. I believe every Christian ought to have some spiritual goals in their lives. It can be something that God has birthed in your heart. It can be something that God has laid on your heart. I don't know if you know this, but I've wanted to have a radio ministry for years. Even dating back to our days in Missouri, I've always wanted to have a radio ministry. Well, guess what? It took many years to fulfill, but that was something God put on my heart. And when we came to Tucson, God made it possible. These are goals that the Holy Spirit has has shown you, something you desire to do for God. It may be a ministry that God has put on your heart. It can be just simply memorizing more scripture, having an effective prayer life. How many know that's a good goal? It can be overcoming a besetting sin, something that you've struggled with, and it is your goal by the help and grace of God to overcome. Paul said that I may know him. I'm going to believe that's a spiritual goal. That I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and even the fellowship of his suffering. So goals can be God-given, something that he puts in your heart. But secondly, goals can also be man-driven, just simple practical goals. Now listen to me. Don't over-spiritualize everything. Some just need to pay off some debts. There are goals that we need that are just simple, basic life, practical goals. Something we desire to do. Something we've always wanted to accomplish. One of the things I've always wanted was to have a teaching degree. I'll tell a little bit more about that story. But I'm so grateful as I look back that I was able to finish my degree and get that degree that I always wanted. But for others, it's paying off a debt. Maybe it's a credit card that you need to pay off. I hate to bring it up, but I'm going to losing weight. I know he said, he just didn't have to bring that one up, did he? (laughs) Finishing your degree. Finishing your education, Olivia. (laughs) All eyes are now on Olivia. And since your eyes on Olivia, getting married could be a goal. (laughs) I was working on this sermon and I jotted down. Pay off debts, lose weight, finish degree, marriage. And I thought somebody may want to say getting out of my marriage. That is not what we're talking about. (laughs) But your career, anything in our practical lives, it is good to live with some goals in your life. You see, because if you don't have any goals, you'll never get anywhere. Amen. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 19. That's that other verse I asked you to look up. Because the Apostle Paul, yes, he had goals in his spiritual life that he may know Christ. But Paul also had some practical goals. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Paul had traveled all over the known world, Asia Minor, on his missionary journeys. But there was one place Paul had never been to, and it was Rome. Rome was the epicenter of the world. But Paul had never been there. And I want you to notice in Acts 19, verse 21. Now, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem. Now, watch this. Saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Everyone say Rome. Paul had a goal in his life, and that was eventually to get to Rome. And to preach the gospel in Rome. Now let me make something very clear. We'll get to the end of that in a moment. But that goal was not fulfilled immediately. As a matter of fact, that goal came much later and through much hardships. We're going to talk a little bit about that for a few moments tonight. But that was Paul's goal. Was eventually to get to Rome so that he could preach the gospel even in Rome. 
Tonight, before I break this down, I want to ask you a couple questions for your own thoughts tonight. What kind of goals do you have in your life? Don't answer it out loud. What kind of goals do you have in your life right now? As an individual, as a married couple, what kind of goals do your family have? What kind of goals have you made for yourself to push yourself? What has God laid on your heart? There's a lot of people, God laid something on their heart because of setbacks and difficulties. They've forgotten about it. Maybe you need the Lord to bring back to your mind those goals. Amen? But the power of a goal can make an incredible difference in your life. Let me share with you a couple things. Number one, goals result in direction. Goals result in direction. Without a goal, our lives simply wander aimlessly. But once we have a goal in our lives, whether it's a spiritual goal or just a practical goal, what it does is it sets forth direction. We now have a path forward. So instead of wandering in circles, so instead of living aimlessly, now we have purpose. First of all, living with purpose. Remember what Paul said? He said, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to the things that are before. He said, I press towards the mark. Every morning, Paul got up and he had a purpose. Every day that Paul lived, he had a purpose in his life. He had something to look forward to. He had, see, that's what goals do. They give us something to look forward to. At the end of Paul's life, do you remember what he said? He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You know, Paul is telling us he never lost his purpose. I heard a quote one time, and I've never forgotten it. A man with no future will always return to his past. Remember that. A man with no purpose will always return to his past. So number one, goals result in direction, giving us purpose for our lives, giving us purpose for our day. But secondly, it's living with precision. Goals help us live with precision. You know, some people live like a rifle. And they shoot straight forward, straight as an arrow. Other people live like a shotgun. They're just all over the place. Come on. I want you to notice what Paul said back in that Philippians 3. He said, this one thing I do. Everyone say one thing. You see, Paul lived his life with laser-like focus. He wasn't tossed around by every wind of doctrine. He wasn't moved by the opinions or even praise of others. But he kept his eyes on the prize, so to speak. He didn't get distracted with all the peripheral stuff. He stayed focused on what God had called him to do. He stayed focused on the goals that he had in his heart. How many have ever gotten distracted while you were driving? How many of you know how that can end up? Do you remember when your kids were little? And you're driving down the road and they're in the back seat arguing and fighting and fussing. And you turn around just for a second to correct them and you almost end up in the ditch. The moment you set a goal, there will be plenty of things that will try to distract you from that goal. How many have ever heard of Arnold Palmer? And no, not the drink. <laughs> the golf legend Arnold Palmer tells a story. He recalls a lesson about overconfidence and distraction. It was the final hole of 1961 Masters Tournament. He had a one-stroke lead and had just hit a very satisfying tee shot. He goes, I felt like I was in pretty good shape. As I approached my ball, I saw an old friend standing on the edge of the green. He stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. I took his hand and shook it, but as soon as I did, I knew... I had lost my focus. On my next two shots, I hit the ball into the sand trap, then put it over the edge of the green. I missed a putt, and I lost the masters. He said, you don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it and be de determined you'll never do it again. He goes, I haven't in the last 30 years. He allowed a handshake to totally distract him from his purpose and his goal. But the Apostle Paul comes to us and says, don't let anyone or anything distract you or deter you from what God has called you to do. Remember, it was Paul who said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was his focus. 
Paul had direction for his life. He didn't wander aimlessly. He knew exactly what he was called to do. He knew exactly what was on his heart and on his mind. And he lived with the purpose and he lived with precision. And I think we'd all agree Paul's life was a success. Church, if you want direction in your life, start setting some goals. Because if you don't, you'll wander forever and never go anywhere. And we see young people today that absolutely have no direction for their lives. And I challenge you parents, listen to me, mom and dad. I challenge you to start sitting down with your kids and start giving them some guidance. Help them to start making some goals and some direction. Now, let me tell you, I hated Andrew leaving. Andrew's 24 years old. I hated him leaving, but at the same time, I told his mama, he needs to get out of the house. Because I don't want my 30-year-old boy still sitting at home milking money off of me. Me and mama are going to go on vacation. All I'm saying is, church, we have way too many people who have no direction in their life. And the reason they have no direction is because they have no goals. Now, there's a plenty of reasons why they don't. For some, it's fear. For some, they've failed at other things and they don't want to fail again. I don't care. But the bottom line is say, God, put something in my heart. Give me something to live for. Amen? Number one, it'll result in direction. Number two, goals not only result in direction, and I'm sorry all the points are coming up, but number two, goals require discipline. Goals require discipline. Let me just say this. No good thing ever comes easy. Let me say it again. No good thing ever comes easy. Let me use an illustration. Have you ever seen those diet commercials that are on TV? And by the way, there's a reason the word diet starts with D-I-E. Just saying. We're planning our, our, our vacation for later in May. Some mama's got me on a diet. It's about to kill me. But I want you, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but have you ever seen these diet commercials, Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, all these that come on TV? Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but this is kind of where they say it. Eat what you want, when you want, however much you want, and still lose weight. But join today before this offer expires. Yeah, right. How many of you know it don't work like that? Listen to what Paul said about discipline. In this life that we're called to live, 1 Corinthians 9, it's one, of the, it's one of the first passages of Scripture I memorized as a young Christian. He said, do you not know that those who race run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. Everyone say temperate. That means exercises self-restraint. It means exercise self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. We an imperishable. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. Lest when I preach to others, I myself become disqualified. That word temperate means exercise restraint. Matter of fact, see that word subjection all the way down towards the bottom? It literally means to enslave. It means to be a slave driver over your flesh. It means to take control over your fleshly desires. You can't lose weight by eating Twinkies and drinking Dr. Pepper. I know that disappoints some of you. But the point is, church, if you're going to have a goal in your life, you're going to have to understand it's going to take some discipline. Can I hear an amen? Number one, you've got to eliminate your obstacles. You're going to have to eliminate those things that get in your way. We must be willing to eliminate those things that hinder our progress and hinder our growth. I, I jotted three things down. Number one's people. This won't be on the screen. Number one is people. People can hinder you. Even your own family or close friends can hinder you. You have to be able to be smart enough and discerning enough that if there is somebody that's hindering you, you've got to eliminate that out of your life. Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Go ahead then. Go nowhere, but make them happy. You have to be careful who you run with. You run with turkeys, you'll start acting like a turkey. That's what the Bible says. He that walks with wise men will be wise. Secondly, pursuits, selfish pursuits. All these little things we want to do can sometimes, we just get too much going. Pleasures, pleasures of life, wanting to indulge and yet somehow make progress. 
when Sheila and I got married back in 1991, I had brought a little bit of debt into our, in our marriage. It wasn't a lot. I think it was around $5,000. One was her ring. You notice how I threw that in to kind of help me out a little bit. Now, a ring wasn't 5000 Please don't. But I had had a, a Sears credit card. They sent it to me when I was in college. If you get a Sears credit card, what are you supposed to do? Go to Sears. That's right. That's what I did. So we got married. I had about $5,000 in debt. And Sheila and I made a, 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 an agreement between each other that with God's help, we were going to pay that $5,000 off within two years. Now, you have to understand... We're pastoring a church of about 30 people. That was, on a good, that was on Easter Sunday. I was doing a ton of substitute teaching. I was trying to be able to make all the ends meet. We paid our tithe. And God miraculously helped us. And within a year and a half, we had paid off that $5,000 debt. Now, let me tell you, it wasn't easy. Back in those days, it was not easy. But we had to discipline our spending there's a lot of things we would have liked to have done. But we knew that if we did it, it would hinder our progress. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen to what Paul said, Hebrews 12, or the writer of Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare or beset us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us lay aside every weight that hinders us. How many have ever heard of Henry Ford? Henry Ford said something very interesting. He said, one of the weaknesses of human beings is trying to do too many things at once. That scatters our effort and destroys our direction. It makes for haste, and haste makes waste. So we do, we do um, things all the wrong ways possible before we come to the right one. Then we think it's the best way because it works, and it was the only way left that we could see. He said, every now and then, I wake up in the morning, headed towards that finality with a dozen things I want to do. I know I can't do them all at once. Someone asked, what do you do about that? Ford said, I, I go out and I take a jog around the house. When I'm running off the excess energy that wants to do too much, my mind clears and I can see what can be done and should be done first. Sometimes we just have way too many things we're all trying to do. We have all these pokers in the fire and we never get anything accomplished. Can I get a witness? And we have to start being smart enough and honest enough to take a step back and say, what do I need to eliminate? What is keeping me from progress? What is keeping me from achieving these goals? And then be willing to eliminate it. Amen? Number two, we have to embrace opportunities. If you and I are going to reach any goal in our life, we're going to have to take advantage of the opportunities that come our way. Now, let me teach you a principle. This won't be on the screen. If you will set a goal, God will give you an opportunity. God is amazing like that. If you'll set a goal in your life, God, whether it's finance, losing weight, getting married, God will give you opportunities. <laughs> Olivia's over there going, I hope he's being prophetic right now. <laughs> but let me just say this, church. Let me say this. You're going to have to be willing to take advantage of the opportunities that come your way. Let me give you an example. You have a goal for your marriage, that you want to strengthen your marriage. You want your marriage to be healthy. Did you know that we have a marriage class tomorrow night? Yep. It's amazing to me how many people want to set goals, but then they don't want to take advantage of the opportunities that will help them meet those goals. Mm -mm -mm. Let me just say this without being too blunt. Quit making excuses. And quit blaming everybody else for why you're not reaching your goals. Let me say one more thing since I'm on this. Quit waiting for people to hand it to you on a silver platter. But you'll find that if you're going to achieve your goals and you're going to reach goals and you're going to accomplish goals, it's going to be baby steps. It's going to be the little things. Somebody say amen. Nobody's going to give you victory on a silver platter. Nobody's going to pave the way for you. You're going to have to learn to fight for it. You're going to have to learn to work for it. You're going to have to put forth the effort. Quit blaming everybody. Quit making excuses and embrace the opportunities that God gives you. Amen. I felt good. Get that off my chest. So many young people, they don't want to do the little things that will help get their goals. Amen. They want to just give into them. When I was in college and I was just starting out, I had opportunities to share my testimony. 
Nobody was about to give me the pulpit at that time, and rightfully so. But you know what they did? I had little opportunities to share my testimony. I had little opportunities to talk about what God had done in my life. And those little opportunities, I didn't get paid for those. It's amazing how young people want to get paid for everything. (laughs) Whatever happened to preach for free? I had a staff member. I will not tell you who he was. But I had a staff member several years ago. He was asked to speak at a particular event. He spoke. It wasn't a big event. And the group that he spoke for didn't give him anything. Didn't give him an honorarium. Now, right, wrong, or indifferent, he came back into my office. And for two weeks, he railed on how they didn't pay him anything for that. And I sat him down and I said, dude, I probably called him brother. I don't think I called him dude. But I said, dude, you better learn something right now. If you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. Get out now. And if you can't do it as unto the Lord, then you don't need to be doing it. My point is this. If you want to set goals for yourself, you're going to have to start embracing the opportunities that come your way to accomplish those goals. Somebody say amen. So goals are going to result in direction for your life. A pathway forward. Number two, goals are going to require discipline. You're going to have to eliminate some things and embrace some things. Number three. Goals recognize determination. If you're going to set a goal in your life, it's going to have determination. I told you I finished my teaching degree a long, long, long time ago. But what I didn't tell you is there were many times I wanted to quit. As a matter of fact, I was three years into my college degree when God called me into full-time ministry. I thought to myself, I don't need this degree. I don't need this teaching degree. I don't need this college education. God called me to preach. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to quit, especially in those formative years. I was pastoring full-time. We were building a church. We had our first child. I was doing my student teaching. All of that was almost too much. But I want to tell you, it was my wife who helped push me through to get that degree. And I am so thankful to this day that I am able to say I finished that degree. Amen. You can thank Sheila for that. Thank you, Sheila. Listen, there are going to be times you do want to quit. There are going to be times you do want to quit. It can be tough if you set goals. I've told you that I come from a cross-country town in Missouri. West Plains, Missouri is known for their cross-country championships. Probably, I don't think there's any other school in Missouri that's won more cross-country championships than West Plains. But we had a coach who believed very simply, if you're going to win, you don't ever quit. As a matter of fact, if you quit a race, he kicked you off the team. Now, if you're puking up blood, that's another story. <laughs> that was a part of his rule. You, don't, you, you run as a team, and you never quit. And if you quit, you're off the team. And you know what it did? It developed a mindset that you never quit the race. You never turn to your neighbor and say, never quit. That's why in 1984, my senior year, we won the Class 4A State Cross Country Championships because he had a team of runners who didn't quit. Did we want to? Oh, Yeah. But tonight, if you're going to reach your goal, you're going to have to have some determination. One, you're going to have to endure some setbacks. You're going to have to endure. Listen, how many have learned in life there are setbacks in life? It doesn't always mean it's your fault. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. That's just a part of living, isn't it? Some of you at work, you've had some setbacks. But you've got a purpose in your mind. You have a goal, and you're going to work through those setbacks. Listen to what Hebrews 12, the rest of that verse says. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Every time you want to quit, go back to the cross. and Remember how Jesus pushed through. Amen. He endured. What I didn't tell you is that before my senior year in cross country, I had to have knee surgery. I'd messed up my knee several years before that, and I had to go in and have arthroscopic knee surgery, and it almost completely wiped me out. But you know what I purposed in my mind? I've come too far, and I've run too many miles, and I worked through it, and I pressed through it, and God helped me to get through that knee surgery. You're going to have disappointments. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have discouragement. But tonight, if you're going to reach your goal, you're going to have to have determination. Secondly, you're going to have to endure the struggles that come your way. Listen to what Paul told Timothy. 
You must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I guess that verse isn't up there. But the truth is, sometimes it's a fight, church. Sometimes it's a battle. Can I hear an amen? Do you know what Tommy Barnett said? Tommy Barnett said, adversity is the breakfast of champions. Some of you tonight need to start setting some goals, but get ready. There's going to be some adversity. There's going to be some struggles. Paul's, remember I told you it was Paul's desire to go to Rome? Remember that way back earlier in the sermon? Some of you are like, Pastor, that was yesterday. Do you remember when Paul said, I must also see Rome? Well, let me tell you something. Paul made it to Rome, but it was not an easy journey. I want you to take your Bibles, and I'm almost done. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Acts 23, please. Now in Acts chapter 19, Paul said, I want to go see Rome. I've got to go see Rome. I've got to go preach in Rome. You get to Acts 23. I want you to look at verse number 11. Paul has been arrested. Paul has been brought in before the authorities. In Acts 23, 11, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem... You must also bear witness at Rome. God was reminding him of his goal. God was reminding him of that desire in his heart. And even in the midst of a trial, even in the midst of false accusation, he says, I'm going to get to Rome. Go to Acts chapter 25. Paul is being tried before Agrippa. Verse number 22, then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear this man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. Hang with me here. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus. Everyone say Augustus. Do you know who that is? That's Caesar. That's the Roman emperor. I decided to send him. This is a man who's being tried. This is a man who's being falsely accused. And everywhere you go, what's happening? He's going to get to Rome. Are you with me? Go to Acts 27. Paul is now on a, he's on a, Carib, he's on a Mediterranean cruise. I almost said Caribbean cruise. He's on a Mediterranean cruise. Acts 27. Verse 22, there is a storm that arises. Verse 22, Paul said, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, for whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Right in the middle of a shipwreck, an angel appears and says, Guess what, Paul? I'm going to get you to Rome because that's your goal. Do you understand this? Go to Acts 28. Acts 28, the ship uh, crashes. They wash up on the island of Malta or Melita. And Acts 28, this is where he's bitten by the viper. Do you remember that? He gets bitten by the snake. And in verse 14 of Acts 28, it says, We were found, brethren, and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you have a goal, you're going to have some shipwrecks. You're going to have some snake bites along the way. You're going to have some trials along the way, but go to Acts 28 and 16. I love this verse. Now, when we came to Rome, Paul made it. Paul made it to Rome, and that was his goal, and that was his desire, and that was his prayer, was to make it to Rome, but it was not easy. You see, Paul never gave up on that goal. Paul never gave up on that desire. Paul never gave up. On that thing in his heart that says, I want to preach in Rome. Though it was filled with setbacks and though it was filled with struggles, God was faithful to get him to Rome. Oh, church, God is so good. But there's a lot of people who've had setbacks and they've given up on the goal. They've given up on the dream. They've given up on what God has laid in their heart. Somebody's offended them. Some of them's betrayed them. But listen to me. If God's put something in your heart, don't you let anything or anybody stand in your way. Amen. So let me wrap this up. Goals result in direction. Goals require discipline. Goals recognize determination. 
And number four, goals rejoice with delight. Goals rejoice with delight. Look at Proverbs 13, 12. I want to tell you in a moment a story about this verse. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. There's no greater joy, ladies and gentlemen, than when you've accomplished a goal in your life. There is no greater sense of fulfillment and satisfaction when you've met your goal. Somebody say amen. I remember last year during the pandemic, I had tried to lose a little bit of weight. So, man, I worked at it. I, it was, I was miserable. But I'll never forget when I reached my goal. I went out and I got the biggest bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> I did. I went to Sonic. I know you're thinking, that, that's not, listen, there is no greater sense of satisfaction when you've accomplished a goal, when you've reached a milestone in your life. Amen. Dale Earnhardt, the great race car driver, said following one race, listen to what he said. He goes, I cried a little bit in the race car on my way to the checkered flag. He said, well, maybe not cried, but at least my eyes watered up a little. There is nothing like knowing you've crossed the finish line. I can't tell you the times that we've paid off vehicles and we get that statement paid in full, balance zero. Times that we've paid off a credit card, balance zero. Let me tell you something, church. If you don't have any goals in your life, you'll never know the joy of crossing a finish line. Let me close with this as our musicians come. I met Sheila in April of 1991. I was a single pastor. She was working in our district office. I needed a piano player. We kind of laugh about it, but it was true. I needed a piano player. I needed a children's worker. And Sheila fit the bill. <laughs> Just kidding. That, that's, those are the side benefits. So I met Sheila in April, and by June, I knew she was the one. So I proposed to her in June of 1991. We set a wedding date October 12th. 1991. I don't know if you count that's about six months. We dated for two months. We were engaged for four. In four months, she pulled off a complete wedding. But we laughed about this verse because during that time of waiting, and during that time, we were in a long distance relationship. She lived three hours away. I guess that's not really long distance, but we didn't have cell phones, so calling it was. But we joked about how during that waiting time, hope deferred makes the heart sick. We're waiting and waiting and waiting. But on October 12th, when the desire comes, it's like a tree of life. The point is, is when you reach those goals in your life, it brings such joy, such sense of accomplishment and fulfillment. And tonight I feel like we've been so bombarded that we've forgotten we need to live with some goals in our lives. There are some of you here tonight. You need to start setting some goals for yourself. Setting some goals for your family, your marriage. Amen? Your finances. The list could go on. But to have something to live for, something to shoot for. Let me give you this last quote and I'm done. I don't even know who said it. I came across it. He said, the man with average mentality, but with control, a definite goal, and a clear conception of how it can be gained. And above all, with the power of application and labor, he's the one who wins in the end. You don't have to have super talent, super powers. You don't have to have super education. You just have to have the desire and a goal in your life. And I want to challenge you tonight as you stand. What kind of goals are you living with tonight in your life? Maybe you've lost sight of a goal that you once had. Maybe there was something years ago in your heart. Let me tell you, it's never too late to set a goal for yourself. You're never too old to set a goal for yourself. Someone says, my goal is simply to retire. Amen. But maybe tonight you need to ask God to put something in your heart, give you something to live for. Remember, the power of a goal will result in direction. It will require discipline. It recognizes determination, but it will rejoice with delight when you reach the goal, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I don't know who it's for, but I thank you that you're a God who helps us. 
You're a God who guides and directs our paths. And Lord, it is not your will for us to wander aimlessly with no direction or purpose. Lord, it is not your will for us just to wander in circles in our lives. But you have called us to that higher calling. You've called us to forget the things that are behind and reach ahead to the things that are before. And I pray that tonight you would, God, begin to put things in our hearts again. Lord, there may be someone here, maybe their dreams were crushed. Maybe they had a goal and it seemed to dissipate. I pray that, Lord, tonight they would purpose in their hearts, God, give me something to shoot for. Give me something to live for. Give me something to go after. Just like Paul did, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I pray for our young people tonight. God, I pray that you'll put something in their heart so real, so tangible, goals for their lives, God. Help them not to be distracted or deterred, but I pray that they would set their forehead like flint. And God, that they will march towards the goals you've put in their heart. So Lord, tonight, speak to us tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We've already given an opportunity for you to come and pray, but I want to ask just a couple real quick questions. If you're here tonight and you'd say, Pastor, I had a goal at one time, but I've just kind of lost the desire. I've kind of lost the, 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 the passion for it, but I'd sure like God to put something back on my heart. Let me see your hand. Is there anybody like that? Amen. I, I had a goal. I had a desire. I had a dream, but some things got in the way, but tonight I need God to help me get back on track. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. How many of you tonight say, you know what, Pastor? I've seen some great things in my life and I've accomplished some great things, but I want God to put some new things in my heart. I want God to give me some new burdens. Let me see your hand if that's you. God, give me, give me something new. God, give me something to go after. Amen. Thank you for your honesty tonight. Here's what I want us to do. It's been a great night. It's been a great day today, actually. But I want us to take just a couple minutes right where you are or if you want to come to the altar. I want each one of us to find a place with God just for a few moments and say, Lord, put something on my heart. Lord, give me something to shoot for. Give me something to live for. Let's all find a place just for a few moments right where you are, down at the altars. But let's take a few moments and say, God, put something on my heart tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, write something on our hearts tonight. Give us a goal. Give us a passion. Lord, give us a desire. Give us something, Lord, to live for. Give us something, Lord, to work towards. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.